Hello, I'm Sally Longley and I'm a spiritual director and retreat leader based at Kanisha Centre for Ignatian Spirituality in Sydney. You might ask, what does a spiritual director do? Well, unlike its name, a spiritual director doesn't direct someone else, uh, but rather sits alongside them and accompanies them in their journey, whatever that journey is. So anybody of any denomination or any faith can come for spiritual direction. And I walk alongside them. And unlike other professions, as a spiritual director, I'm not the expert on your life. My stance or my posture is that you are the expert on your life. And so within you is the wisdom you need for the way ahead for you. And all I do is listen with you, listen to God, listen to what God might be doing in your life, listen to what's happening in you and maybe reflect back so that you can hear and see more clearly what your own wisdom is for the way forward. So together, it's like shoulder to shoulder. We walk together. I walk alongside you. I accompany you as you go on in your journey. And anyone can come for spiritual direction. Someone who's struggling from trauma, uh, someone who just is more serious or very serious about their discipleship, wants to know how to live better, uh, how to live in a more godly way, how to hear God more clearly, how to follow God more closely, whatever their image of God is. Um, or it can be someone who just uh, wants to come and find whoever this God is for the first time. So it's open to everyone and anyone. And retreat leading is something else I do. And that's when people come away for a retreat. Uh, it can be one day two days, five days, some come for as long as eight days or 30 days. And there's a deep hunger in society at the moment for silence. Uh, we live such busy lives, zooming along in the fast lane and not giving ourselves time to actually know what's going on inside me. Um, so often when someone comes on a retreat, uh, one needs to be a little bit careful because often the things that we're running and running and running from in our lives, we come on a retreat, we stop, there's silence. And then all of a sudden, all the things that we haven't processed, haven't looked at, the niggles that have really been begging us to take, pay them attention, suddenly just hit us. It's almost like we're, we've been driving along a freeway and suddenly we stop and bang, you know, we get hit from behind. And so sometimes it can be a little bit confronting. Other times you may find that this is you enter into a kind of a serenity and you think, I've been so hungry for this for such a long time. Recently I published a book and it's called Walking the Labyrinth as the Beloved in John's Gospel. One of the reasons I took John's Gospel is because it is so full of symbolism and metaphor. It's very rich in the way it speaks to us in a multiplicity of ways. And so does the labyrinth. The labyrinth too is very rich in metaphor and symbolism. So the two seem to have a natural affinity. They go well together. So what I've done is I've introduced ways of walking the labyrinth, praying the labyrinth, using John's Gospel. And so instead of praying just with the top few centimetres of our minds, uh, when we often pray, sometimes we learn to pray by just talking to God, asking God for things, you know, having a shopping list for God. Um, but this way, we actually walk with our whole bodies and we pray with our whole bodies and we're listening with all of our senses and responding, listening, responding, dialoguing with God about the metaphors and symbols, the metaphors and symbols in John's Gospel, the metaphors and symbols in the labyrinth. So let's now look at some of the types of labyrinths. So I'm going to concentrate on the Chartres labyrinth. <laughs> I'm going 
going to concentrate on the Chartres labyrinth. Um, there are many different patterns, but this one uh, comes out of the Christian tradition and the earliest record we have of it is actually in the Chartres Cathedral outside Paris. And you can walk this labyrinth uh, today if you visit there. It's, it's marvellous. It's on the floor in the centre of the cathedral. And on Fridays they clear all the chairs from it. And if you're lucky and they're not having some other ceremony there, when you arrive you can walk that labyrinth. There's a lot of history behind labyrinths. I'm not going to go into that now. I have written briefly on that in my book and there are many uh, very authoritative books out there on all the history to do with the labyrinths. What I want to mainly focus on is the pattern of the labyrinth and how we pray with that pattern. When we built the Chartres Labyrinth uh, at the Retreat Centre, we decided to try and make it as harmonious as possible with the environment. So we had at its very centre a tree. We kept the tree that was already there, let it be the centre, had a seat put around that, and then the labyrinth uh, circles that, if you like. If you look at the pattern carefully, you'll see that there's almost, it's bounded at its rim, if you like, by a, basically a circular shape. And this is almost, I mean, this in itself is symbolic. It represents, if you like, the embrace of God. Uh, it can represent anything, it can re represent uh, a sacred space. Whatever that is, it can mean anything to you that you allow it to mean, whatever's meaningful for you. Then if you look again carefully, you'll see that there's basically a cross formed through the whole of the pattern. And this cross is formed by the turns and the weavings of the path that goes through. And you'll notice that sometimes you're walking along and you'll follow the path and you'll see that there's a complete about turn. And we'll actually look more detail at all these bits later, but you'll see that there's an about turn. It's almost like you're, you're turned back, like 180 degrees. And those turn backs form or make this cross. So you can let that represent or symbolize anything you like. And then every alternate path, if you like, seems to go through that cross. And these can represent the small resurrections, the miracles, the openings that can come to us. But again, we'll look at more detail at this later. There's a big difference between a maze and a labyrinth. A maze is a puzzle. It engages your mind and it seeks to confuse you, trap you, block you. And the aim of a maze is for you to find the centre and then you've beaten the maze. A labyrinth, however, is one single path. It might look like a maze, but actually once you begin the path, all you have to do is put one foot in front of the other and you will eventually get to the centre. You may get or feel like you're lost on the way, but you're not. All you need to do is put one foot in front of the other because there is only one path in and only that same one path back out. So whilst the aim of the maze is to find the centre of the maze, the aim of a labyrinth is to actually get in touch with your own centre. There's a big difference. And there are many aids to prayer. This is one, the labyrinth. Some people find it very helpful to light a candle and create a a sacred space that way, to sit in a favourite chair, a comfortable chair, and just to be very still, to be in nature. Different people find different ways of praying. Some use rosary beads, some want to lie prostrate, some kneel. We're all different, and all of these aids to prayer can help in different ways. And this is one way you might like to experiment as an aid to prayer using a labyrinth.
there's no right way and there's no wrong way to walk the labyrinth. There's your way. And so you can do it in whatever way is resonant for you. You can go at whatever speed is right for you. And some people skip or dance the labyrinth. For others, they find the labyrinth slows them right down, helps them really become quite mindful of what they're doing and taking each step, really, if you like, savouring each step, each moment, each interaction as their foot, if you like, kisses the ground and they feel the calligraphy of the ground beneath their feet. They start to listen and notice things that in normal life, at the normal speed we live, we just don't allow ourselves to. When you come to the beginning of the labyrinth, at the only entrance, there is only one entrance and that also is the exit, as you stand there, as you come to that space, you may like to make some kind of gesture, as some people do. Take a moment when you walk into um, a magnificent cathedral or some very sacred space. It could be in the middle of a most beautiful forest. You take a moment, you just take a moment to notice and to let your whole being, if you like, honour that wonder. And so you can take a moment in whatever way you like when you begin. You might want to make a gesture. Uh, or you may even like to take an object on the journey as you pray the labyrinth. Take this object with you. Uh, it could be anything. It could be something that symbolizes something, represents something for you. It could be a seed pod, a piece of bark, a flower, some water, a bowl of water even. Something that symbolizes something very important for you that you want to be praying with or praying about or something you want to release or let go of. Some people find that sort of thing very helpful. And again, it's just what it means to you. It doesn't matter what it means to anybody else or what anybody else might think. You do your own thing. And so you're at the entrance. You take a moment. You've chosen whether to take an object with you or not. And then you begin the journey. Life is full of surprises and about turns. Some of them are pleasant, some of them not so pleasant, can be quite disturbing. So as you walk the labyrinth, notice the times when you do these very sharp bends, almost like a hairpin bend. You're turned back on yourself almost. Uh, let those times speak to you. Maybe speak to you of times in your life or whatever you're carrying or thinking about praying through at the time. Just let it evoke in you what it will. Be ready to be receptive. Receive what it might be saying to you. And just notice what happens in you as you... It happens a lot in the labyrinth. You get turned back again and again. And then slowly you'll come towards the centre actually quite soon when you start walking the labyrinth you'll find yourself very close to the center and you may think oh my gosh you know I'm, I'm almost there that was a quick walk but before you know it you're actually then led right out onto the outskirts and that can be like life again too sometimes we can feel like we've arrived we've got something we've achieved something we've arrived at some kind of place we've been longing to be at within ourselves and then we find all of a sudden well actually no somehow we're far further from that than we thought and that's all right and when you're suddenly thrown out on the outskirts again you can feel maybe lost uh, a sense of how long have i been walking for how much further have i got to go and that's so like life so let those speak to you as well just remembering that within the labyrinth as opposed to a maze you are never lost. You're always held, if you like, within the embrace of God. God doesn't trap us. We can step out at any point. Though you might feel lost, we're never lost to God. All you need to do is just put one foot in front of the other. When you're 
when you get to the center, allow the center to represent anything that resonates for you. Could be a sacred space, could be your own center, could be a place of encounter with God, or even a place of encounter with Jesus, like it was uh, for the Samaritan woman around the well. Perhaps the center is like the well in Samaria where the woman encounters Jesus and has a conversation. It could be anything. So take your time in the center and take as long as you need. Just be there, noticing, receiving, releasing, absorbing, letting things touch you. Again, it's that wonderful slowness that we don't allow ourselves in so much of our lives. So take the time you need. And if you've been praying with an object, this might be a place or a time when you want to put that object down, leave it there. Um, that way you might want to be saying, you know, I, I entrust this problem or this person or this burden, whatever it is that you've been carrying, I entrust that to God. Or it could be, you know, I want to let this thing go forever. You know, I want to finally say goodbye to it. Could be something joyous, you know, or it could be something tough that you've been wrestling with for some time. Whatever it is, take your time. If, if laying it down there is the right thing, then do that. And then when you're ready, take a deep breath and then begin the journey out. And remembering the journey out is the same way you came in. There's only one path. In your journey outward, you're following the same path that brought you into the center. So you know that it's going to take about the same length of time and you'll encounter similar turns. Maybe also still a sense of being lost, a sense of how long have I got to go? Uh, even tempting to look at your watch and think, you know, have I got time for this? Try to just let yourself be where your feet are. So often we live a distance from our bodies. Um, I think it's Mr. Duffy in James Joyce's book, The Dubliners, who says, um, it, it, James Joyce writes of Mr. Duffy, Mr. Duffy lived a short distance from his body. And this is what happens when we think something's about to finish, our minds go off into the drive home or the meal we've got to prepare. Try and be where your feet are and let the journey outward in, unfold in whatever way is right. Continue to notice metaphors like the small green sprout that's growing through a hard section of mud, perhaps. All these things speak to us. Nature speaks to us. God speaks to us through all things. And so continue to be receptive. And as you get to those turns and those turnbacks, what does that do to you as your journey outward? What's the difference? Is there a difference between what then and when you walked in? And then again, you'll go out to the outskirts and you still won't have been at the exit. Then you'll be brought back in. And so it goes on. It's still the journey of life. When you get to the exit, take a moment and pause. What's happened for you? What are you taking from this time of prayer? Sometimes can be incredibly significant and one can be really uh, quite moved. There can be other times, because every journey is different, when you think, well, nothing really happened. But when we're in God, nothing never happens. Something always does happen. It's just that we're often not aware of it. So just notice, what, what has it been about this journey? What's been the gift? What am I taking from this time into the world, into my next phase. And because all of life is also a prayer, this time of prayer sort of comes to a close, but you move off into prayer. And if you have chosen to see the labyrinth as, if you like, the embrace of God, it's not as if you walk out of the embrace of God, you just walk out into God in a different way. So what is it for you? Notice what it is. You might want to express something. 
of gratitude or make a gesture. You might want to sing out loud or say something out loud if no one else is around. If other people are there, just do what's appropriate for you. And then slowly leave the labyrinth and move out into the next phase of your journey.